Super excited to be on this call today and thank you to everyone attending. Uh, my name is Anthony. I do content marketing at ChartHop and um, at ChartHop, we very much believe in the power of data to help organizations become more resilient and stay agile uh, in virtually any future situation. Um, and that's obviously very top of mind when it comes to our hiring and recruiting plans. Uh, so now I'd like to kick it off to um, our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Jillian Riley. Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm Jillian Riley, the Director of Talent Acquisition at Better Cloud, which is the leading SaaS management platform. And I oversee all of recruiting and strategy here. So I'm managing the recruiters and our coordinators, as well as partnering with our hiring managers and the ELT to really drive strategy home. Hi everyone, I'm Aimee. I'm the senior recruiter here at Chart Hub. Um, first internal recruiter hire, so lots of stuff to get done, leading the recruitment efforts across all um, segments and focusing on employee branding, strategy, and many more. Great, and uh, you know, welcome again to our topic, leveraging data and culture to grow your team. Um, in this past year, there's obviously been tectonic shifts in the HR people industry and uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot of companies really thinking about how they were going to restructure their orgs, um, ways to approach layoffs and um, figuring out what different ways that they would have to accommodate for staff in remote or hybrid settings. Uh, but more recently, as the vaccine is rolling out throughout the country and the globe, and we're seeing a lot more job openings come up and that's really shifted the experience for candidates to be more of a candidate focused market where um, it's now on the employers to uh, compete amongst themselves for the best talent out there. Um, and it's become, because it's become increasingly important to see how companies are positioning themselves uh, some things that have become top of mind are not only having a better understanding of the data involved in your recruiting pipeline, but also how you communicate your culture and your uh, company to prospective candidates. And so that's why like today for uh, this webinar, we're gonna chat through these different trends in uh, recruitment and employer branding, some tips for how to collect data that can help you inform those different initiatives and also how you can approach understanding what your org's inter internal culture is and think of strategies of how that comes up uh, to your candidates during the interview process or even the ways that they find out about your company. Uh, just to give a little bit more context, um, as companies increasingly move towards data-driven approaches to recruiting and HR, uh, having a deep understanding of a movement through candidate pipeline is more important for reducing time to hire um, and ensuring that you hire the right people at the right time. And infused through that process are the, is the importance of candidate experience and having an understanding of how they will relate to the people at your company when they join. Um, here are just some high level statistics about the growing importance of candidate experience and employer branding in the uh, interview and talent acquisition process. 78% uh, of candidates say that the candidate experience they get is a great indicator of how a company values its people. 62% of Glassdoor users agree that their perception of a company improves after seeing an employer respond to a review. Um, and companies with strong employer brands see 50% more qualified applicants and take one to two faster time to hire. So not only is employer branding important in making sure that people have a good understanding of your company and what it stands for, but there's also really tangible ways that it improves outcomes for your hiring and recruiting team and your business overall. Um, and with that, we're going to just jump into the presentation. And I'm really curious to hear from both Jillian and Aime on these topics as they have a lot of uh, great experience and knowledge uh, for the field. So um, just to start out, I'd like to hear more about what are these shifts that we've seen in hiring uh, when global shutdown started last March. Uh, Jillian, if you'd like to kick us off. 
Yeah. So I, I think like every other company, uh, Better Cloud went fully remote uh, mid-March uh, of 2020. And um, by April, we went fully on a hiring freeze. And at that point, we had quite a large recruitment team, um, two leaders, and we had to really shift our mindset of what we were going to do um, with all of this, this free time. Recruiters aren't used to having a, a lot of time to fill, right? We're used to just executing on roles mostly. Um, so in hindsight, it actually gave us time to work on some strategic projects that we just had not had the chance to or the time to really uh, put a ton of effort into. Um, and so we shifted and really started to look at processes and clean up um, the systems that we had in place. We also implemented a few new um, softwares just to make sure that when the world opened up on the other side, we were set up for success. And so uh, it, it really did work in our favor. Um, our greenhouses never looked cleaner. Um, we were able to roll out, um, you know, interview training and um, really go with, with more of a tailored approach. But, um, you know, if, if, if the global pandemic never happened, I don't know that we would have ever had the chance to do that. So maybe something good came out of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I may, I know you have tons of experience, not just from internal recruiting at ChartHop, but, but, but also from the agency side. I also love to hear from, from you on this as well. Absolutely. So funny enough, um, when the pandemic hit, I was actually working on the agency side of recruitment and it went from working across multiple clients in different industries to nothing. Right. Um, so, you know, on the agency side, I work with clients across real estate, technology, healthcare and construction. And it's really interesting to see how every industry um, responded to the market. So I've actually had clients in the real estate industry focusing on actually being on site 100%, obviously with precautions, and all of my tech clients shifted to that remote um, workforce. And something I've realized is that not every company is set up to work remotely. And I think like coming from learning about everything that has happened this past year, it's really getting the right technology in place to make sure that everyone is set up for success. Anyone that's not comfortable going to the office, um, and the conversations I would have with candidates are, you know, when the roles were picking up again is, OK, well, is this 100 percent remote? I'm not comfortable. This was still throughout the summertime where, yes, cases were lower, but the risk is still high. Um, so during that downtime, um, I didn't get to work on any internal fun stuff like Jillian. However, I wanted to use my specialty, right? Reaching out to folks that needed help on refreshing their resume, interview tips, right? This is the time now to actually give back, right? And help folks that never had that, you know, mentor or any access to a recruiter. And that's what I guess I spent the last couple of months doing. Um, but it just feels so good to really help, um, but also understand the different ways that different industries are approaching this. Absolutely. And now that we um, are shifting back into the job market opening again, I'm curious any overall big trends you're noticing there before we kind of deep dive into, into this a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is I've never seen a hotter candidate market right now. Um, companies are are hiring like crazy. Uh, I think people are getting vaccinated and that's opening up offices. And um, it's just a complete candidate driven marketplace right now. And so I think companies now more than ever are having to uh, sell themselves a little harder than they they have in the past. And so that's that's one of the biggest uh, you know tricks that we've been giving hiring managers or tips, I should say, is it's got to be selling a sort of a two-way street here. We need to obviously make sure that a candidate is a good fit for your environment and that they have the skills, but you are up against, you know, everyone right now. And so we need to be selling why they want to come join you and, and, you know, putting your best foot forward, uh, first as well. Um, and then I think just, you know, uh, leaning more on, on data um, and really enabling your teams to make strategic decisions as we're building out, um, you know, I think companies were building and growing at a really fast pace pre-COVID um, and companies are being more thoughtful now. As we're going back, you're seeing maybe leaner hiring plans. You're seeing um, just teams uh, lean on data and just make more thoughtful decisions instead of running uh, as fast as lightning, if, if you will. <laughs> yes, we, we love to hear everything about intentional decision making. <laughs> um, Ivey, any, any thoughts you have, have there from your end? 
Yeah, everything Jillian mentioned, I think, you know, six months ago, the market was the complete opposite, right? Everyone was looking for a job again, and all these um, companies are hiring again. I think to really set the companies up for success is there's two things to it that I personally truly believe in is one candidate experience has to be white glove service all around, no matter what happens, every touch a candidate has with anyone in your company is an experience. The last thing you want is, you know, something to fall through the crack and you get a class to review that's not fully true about your company, right? So I think like the team really needs to strive on that and the business and the hiring managers and the hiring team needs to agree on that as well. Um, the second piece is really being transparent, right? You know, being able to let candidates know exactly what to expect. Are you fully remote? Are you hybrid? What are the expectations, right? And I think like it comes full circle when just having that again, very great candidate experience, bring on the right people. But also when you're hiring, yes, it's a tough market right now, but quality over quantity, right? If you need to hire 10 engineers, please make sure the engineers are actually qualified. You're not just hiring just to hire and fill a seat. I think it's just, you know, but also take a step further. Everything, um, every time I work with a hiring manager, I do educate them that they need to hire at 80% of the profile and leave 20% for that, you know, candidate to come in and be groomed and get challenged, right? Because if they are 100% of the profile, they're going to demand a promotion within six months. They're going to be so bored and looking for a new job. So there's a lot of things to factor in, but these are some points that I definitely um, like look at and, and continue um, pushing forward with. Absolutely. And, you know, to just speak to what you were both saying about how it's such a hot candidate market. I remember when I was in the job market last June and, you know, you hear everyone who was in that experience together at the beginning of the pandemic, just sending off things to LinkedIn, seeing what will stick. Uh, but now I think it's a completely different story where there's a lot of opportunities out there for highly qualified candidates. And it's, it's definitely more on their domain to, to be picky and choosy and really understand what they want um, and, and definitely bringing up transparency um, and, and opportunities for growth is a really great way to make sure that you're meeting candidates where they are and what their expectations might be. Um, I'm curious what other key lessons or takeaways that you've learned over the last year that you've started implementing. I loved hearing this 80, 20% rule from you. I mean, I think that's really great. I'm curious, uh, what what other lessons you might have uh, taken in this time? I think for me, um, employees are your most important assets, right? You need to make sure you have the right processes in place, programs in place to make sure that they are happy. Um, but at the same time, this comes down to investing in a people team, right? I think HR and recruitment are just to a lot of companies in the past and a lot of industries are just, you know, back office, right? We're just here placing, you know, uh, hires and seats and moving along. We need to make sure that, you know, HR has a seat at the table and that, you know, across the leadership team, they do value HR and people team to really set everyone up for success. Um, because whether you're a 30 person company or a 50,000 person company, the CEO should never be having conversations around employee, you know, um, uh, relations or benefits or anything like that. I think like the earlier you can put a people team in place, whether it's having one person for HR, one, per one person for um, recruitment, it saves costs, right? You don't have to go out to agencies and fill those um, seats for you or using a consultant that's just coming in, doing a few trainings and leaving. Employees care about having someone to go to, right? When having any issues or just someone to lean on, right? So I think like it's really, really important for all companies, no matter how early stage you are, have that people team in place. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, you know, I think I'll just echo on that, right? Of the importance. And I think it also helps with in this competitive market, you can lean on agencies, but agencies are never going to know your brand as much as, you know, an internal recruiter is. And so I think, you know, whether you are, uh, you know, a seed company, the importance of getting uh, a recruitment team and a people professional right off the, like right out of the gate are super important because it's going to keep your costs down. And it's also going to just keep brand reputation high. hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. And something I really loved about what I may said um, about the importance of setting these strong foundations uh, that Jillian, you also mentioned when your team shifted uh, it's um, the focus of the recruiting team you had on building more processes and systems. I'm wondering if you could say more about what that process was of, you know, maybe deeper dive into what they worked on, what foundations were they really uh, creating that you've now been able to leverage today? 
Yeah. So we started to really lean on data and before we could, you know, make decisions that were based in data, we had to make sure that the data was clean. So it started off by cleaning up our greenhouse, which I think I mentioned, um, making sure that we were using the same processes across the board for every interview we were hiring. So we could look at everything through the same lens. So that was, you know, figuring out the appropriate uh, steps in an interview should have, whether that was four steps or five steps, some interviews had nine steps. Like, so we brought everything down to like the same same level of interviews um, and just really cleaned up the the internal system there. Um, we also, I think I mentioned, we um, implemented another system. We implemented a system called GEM, which helps us just um, do more of a streamlined uh, approach when it comes to pipelining. And so we're, that data also feeds into our systems. Um, so we're able to look at data from the top to the bottom of our funnel. Uh, and then we did a ton of trainings. We knew that uh, we knew we would start to hire again. And so we implemented something called better interviewing. And that was just our way to train and make sure that interviewers are going in to the room prepped, right? Like there's the last thing you want to do is throw an interview on someone's calendar and just say, have at it, right? You need to make sure that they know who they're interviewing and what their role is and uh, make sure that they feel comfortable and prepared so that they can have the best conversation with the candidate. Um, we actually just got it out of one of our trainings now. So it's something that we've brought with us after um, after COVID and we, we do it on a bi-monthly basis. And it's just the chance to anyone who's new, anyone who's new to the interview process um, can get to understand how we interview at Better Cloud. It should be specific to your company. Um, your interview style should represent who you are as a brand. Um, and so those were some of the, the key things that we did. And, and I'm sure we'll get into this piece later, but um, I think the emphasis on diversity also um, was something that we really doubled down on within the last year. Uh, and we did a, a ton of work there. I was really fortunate that our, our general counsel um, stepped up as sort of our head uh, from the executive standpoint. So there's now a partner when it comes to diversity and recruitment and, uh, and a voice back to the executive team, which I think is has been game changer for Better Cloud. Um, we tie diversity uh, OKRs and we make sure that it is top of mind for the ent entire company. Um, we've launched a diversity council as well as formalized ERGs. And then uh, the, the recruitment team is doing a ton of partnership with those two groups to make sure that um, diversity is staying top of mind through through the entire pipeline. Yeah, and we absolutely are going to, to dive deep into DEI um, very soon. But I want to kind of take a step back a bit. I'll be, take, a, take a step back for a second, <laughs> because um, it, it is also part of this conversation about culture and what work you might do to either, you know, now that companies have moved to remote or hybrid, it does change what culture is, what it looks like, what it feels like. And I am curious, and, and obviously DEI is an important part of that, making sure that everyone is able to show up at work as they are and represent themselves um, in a way that they stay engaged and happy and productive. Um, but I am wondering if uh, you could also talk a little bit more about um, how you generally approached culture building throughout the pandemic. Uh, and Jillian, if, since uh, you just were talking about a lot of that great DEI stuff, I'm curious, any other initiatives from Better Cloud there? Yeah, so the biggest thing from a from a cultural standpoint that we implemented was really um, inserting our values into our interview process. Um, so our Better Cloud values are um, sort of our our north star, if you will. Um, so there we have we have four. Um, core values. Uh, and so we implemented those into our process just because you've lost this year, right? You've lost the aspect of an interview where a candidate gets to come on site and they get a tour of the office and they get to see everyone like working and, and socializing. And so we wanted to add another layer into our interview process that was purely um, driven around culture. But what we didn't want this to be was just, uh, you know, a chance for you to, you know, chat with somebody who, um, you know, culture is such a loaded word, right? That's what I'm trying to get to is it's, we, we really wanted it to be more values driven at the core of who we were. Um, and so we've leaned on a very small group of um, better clatters uh, who are going in and really this is a, an interview that the candidate should be driving. The candidate is getting a chance to ask questions. Um, they're leading this process. It's completely cross-functional. So it may be that an engineer is interviewing a sales rep and that would never be part of the normal process, but it's just to really drive cross-functional um, collaboration as well as uh, the, the cultural aspect. 
I love that. I, I think that idea of bringing values into interviews is so cool and really important. Um, and, and so, I mean, I know that, um, especially as you were saying, how important it is to staff up both um, a people team and recruiters early on. Um, obviously here at Chart Hop, uh, we are, I, I can personally say how grateful I am that we, we took that approach. And I'm curious what's been top of mind for you right now um, about some of this culture defining work um, as your team is getting settled and putting things in motion? Yeah, great question. I think it's tricky for us because we are a fully remote company, right? So we're never going back to the office again. But something that we are looking to roll out is, you know, listening to our employees more, right? Asking different poll questions every other week regarding flex workspace, right? If anyone's interested in heading back to an office, maybe twice a week or so, we'll definitely look into locations to expand on that. Um, and just making sure that, you know, we are constantly having different events throughout the year. And now that everything's a little bit more safer, people are more comfortable, we did finalize our first offsite in September, which is super exciting. I think from a people standpoint, it's just really important to check in with employees, right? Understand what's important to them, what they're looking for. Um, this month, is there anything fun we can do as a group, whether it's a virtual uh, escape the room or anything like that? Because the the way you're interacting with your colleagues, you're not walking over to someone's desk anymore like, hey, I want to go grab a coffee or like want to grab lunch. It's it's it can get awkward. I'm not going to lie, you know, having a Zoom conversation and Zoom fatigue is something that's really real. I think, you know, top of mind for the people team is making sure that employees are engaged, happy. And if there's, and we're always open to ideas as well, right? If they've worked with um, a previous company and the HR team did something fun that they want us to do, we're all ears. So I think it's really important just to, you know, hear from the employees and continue building on a strong culture, especially if you are in a remote setting or even in a hybrid setting as well. Absolutely. And, you know, we, um, we actually just all filled out an employee engagement survey uh, just last week where um, we, we were asked questions about how would we define our culture. And, and I know that's something that I'm excited about um, on the marketing side, working with Aime and her team is really thinking about things like employee, employee value proposition and uh, hearing directly from our colleagues um, how they would define culture and how they would define working here and finding ways to channel those through, not just, um, obviously, I may, you will be taking care of how that works within our interview structure, but uh, the exciting part for me is thinking about how that shows up in uh, any of our social media presence or how we might attract candidates in that way. Um, and even building more fully out our career page, which um, is such an important project and really making sure that there's a clear understanding of um, how we value culture, how we value diversity, um, not necessarily looking people to be culture fit, but for people to be focused on um, what the values are and what the work output is so that we can all get excited and online with that. Um, so it's, it's been a very- You guys did that. Sorry, what? No, I, I was, I was gonna say yeah. I love that. I love that you. <laughs> I love that you did it from the top, uh, the bottom up approach, right? That's a very similar way to how we did it. And I think if if people walk away with one thing on this call today is making sure that you're driving culture from your employees and not something that your executives are just putting out into the world. The culture will never stick if it's your CEO saying, "Here are our values" or "Here is our culture." Follow it. It has to come from like the the roots, right, of the employee base. And so, um, love that. Love that you all took that approach. Yeah, and it's um, it, like I, I completely agree. I, I wish there was like a snapping um, emoji reaction button for Zoom because uh, everything about you said the bottom up approach to culture is absolutely the way to go. And it's how you can make sure that when people come on board, they what they were told is or what they're expecting is what they actually see. Um, so so that's great. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, to talk more about kind of like the interview process. And I wanna understand more deeply how candidates are moving through the different touch points um, in both processes that uh, you have and what ways that you are supporting a better candidate experience as part of the interviews. Um, I may, 
But let's let's have you kick kick us off here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really starts with having a really strong internal process, right? But also letting the entire company know that this is a partnership between hiring managers, hiring teams, executive, and recruitment, right? At the end of the day, we want to make sure we find the best candidate for you, but it needs to be a group effort, right? Whether it's, you know, making sure that everyone gets the right training, right? Making sure there's no bias um, when it comes to interviewing and whatnot. But I also feel like when it comes to, you know, touch points, we use Greenhouse and we pull reports every single week regarding candidates, their status, where they are, if anyone's falling out, what are the reasons, let's regroup on that and make sure that that doesn't happen again. So there's so many different factors to look at from a data standpoint, which I love. Um, and Greenhouse has been great with it. But it's also making sure that, you know, you're distributing the responsibilities across different staff members equally, right? And providing that support where it's like, if it's your first time interviewing, like, let's have this conversation, come to me with questions, there's never a silly question here. And having that, you know, um, that I guess like open door policy, because sometimes people are afraid to ask questions and they'll just go into the interview thinking they know what they're doing, but, you know, it could be their first time interviewing, right? And they might say something they shouldn't be saying and then it's like a lawsuit or anything like that so there's so much to that piece but i think the best candidate experience um is providing that white glove service right touch points with candidates checking in on them making sure that you know um they are getting the right material to set them up for success whether it's sending over the folks um linkedin profiles or jumping on a prep call whatever the case is i think you know every step a candidate takes and every person has mentioned that they speak with is an experience and they will take that um, pretty far as well um, within the process. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo everything she said. I, I just, you know, what I would add in there is um, we also have to remember that we're in this digital workforce now. And so everything we're doing is is losing that, that that human element um, when you really think about it. And so I think um, something that we've been doing is, is making sure that both the candidate as well as the interviewers are prepared for what that means. So making sure you have a well-lit space, making sure that if there's going to be distractions that happen with your, you know, whether you have a dog or your home, your, your homeschooling, like setting the expectations with the candidates up front of here's what might happen or I'm going to take notes. You may see me typing. I'm paying attention. I'm here. I'm engaged. But just letting them know what you're going to be doing so nothing comes of a surprise. Um, that's been really helpful. Um, I think also just, uh, you know, making sure that candidates have time to prepare. Um, I think oftentimes, especially with the pace that the, the market is running right now, we want to get candidates in, right? And so you're looking to move as fast as you can, but you have to remember that they need time to prepare. And so giving them sort of that space to breathe and know who they're going to be chatting with, what they need to prepare for that interview. If there's a demo, if there's a presentation, um, not letting not letting the, the eagerness of the market sort of get in the way of what that candidate needs to deliver on. Absolutely. And I'm curious, um, are there any ways that you, either of you, follow up with candidates to um, hear about how their experience went? What are ways that you're kind of like in iterating on your process of making sure that you're fine tuning things? Yeah, so we do candidate surveys again through through Greenhouse. And so they're going out to candidates, whether they have been hired, whether they've been rejected, um, they're automatic and they they go out um, at random. So it's not like we're controlling who is getting a candidate survey uh, because we really want to see what the actual experience was like. And so those have been been a game changer for us. Um, and then we also just do a 48 hour touch point with any active candidates to make sure that we're hearing how the process is going, if they've had any roadblocks, if they have any questions, we're just keeping really tight um, with the candidates and whether that's coming from a hiring manager or a recruiter, or even our coordinator, um, just making sure that there's constant communication. I love that. I love the 48 touch point. I'm stealing that from you. Um, you know but <laughs> I also feel like this is just me, right? We haven't started rolling out Canada survey yet. There's just, you know, we will put that in place probably in the next, um, you know, couple of weeks, but something that works for me personally um, is texting, right? This might or might not work for a lot of candidates, but because of how things are moving, how fast things are moving, I'm not going to sit around and wait for an email to get back to me. I'm also not going to call you and go straight to a voicemail because everyone is working right now, right? You need to be respectful of everyone's day to day. So for me, after an interview, I would just either text a like, hey, how did it go? Like any feedback and any concerns, right? I think 
the most important thing being on the people team, or even as a recruiter, it's listening. You need to make sure you're catching little things that are off in conversations and really getting ahead of it. If there's any concerns and they're meeting with the VP as next steps, utilize those concerns, prep the VP and make sure that they know exactly how to go into the conversation and be ready to sell and continue selling on the opportunity. So there's so many different ways. And I think like everyone needs to find their own style um, and see what's important, right? Efficiency and quality is key for me. Um, so that's the way I like to operate. Absolutely. And um, as we're talking about things that candidates really care about and something that uh, is definitely top of mind during their journeys through the interview process. Um, it's a lot right now, especially around DEI. Um, you know, according to Gallup and other sources, Gen Z and millennial generations currently make up almost half of the workforce. And that's only going to grow in the next few years as uh, people graduate and, and enter the market. And we're also seeing that when it's the candidates turn to ask questions during interviews, they're asking about culture, they're asking about diversity, they're asking about the demographic makeup of your leadership team. And so I'm curious, what are ways that you showcase um, inclusive cultures during the interviews, especially um, as Jillian, you mentioned, going through this big process with uh, creating the ties with the executive team and the council on DEI and uh, the different ERGs you have um, yeah, I'm just curious, what are, what are ways that you're showcasing uh, inclusivity to candidates during interviews? Yeah, I think I can um, touch on that. So as a remote first company, um, our biggest goal is to really make sure that employees feel connected, supported and engaged, right? Um, some things that we try to do within culture is having smaller groups and having virtual meals, right? Whether it's happy hours, as we call it, retreats and offsites, making sure that each department has a budget to utilize to make sure they have team bonding events. But I think one thing that I really, really love about the way you know, Chart Hub is operating is that when it comes to diversity, it's more than how you look, right? We take it a step further. It's about your background, the industries you come from. Shout out to our head of sales. Um, he's hired two folks on his team that never came from software sales. And I think it's just having people that are so open-minded to different backgrounds. It's just so nice when it comes to the diversity standpoint. But also to another point is that a lot of folks now are looking at diverse candidates. I think it's really, really important during the interview process to never make any candidate feel like they're moving up forward in the process because they're a diverse candidate, right? So really need to make sure it's a great experience that, does, that it doesn't ever come to light um, because if it was me and I found out that I was only getting hired because I'm a diverse candidate, it's probably not somewhere I, oh, I really want to work. So there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to diversity but it should absolutely be top of mind for every single company. It should never be an afterthought. Absolutely. Um, Jillian, I, I know you you touched upon some of the um, the work with the that the ERGs are doing and you were doing with the DI Council. I'm wondering uh, if we can just double tap on that now to, yeah. to hear ways that your team sure. can strengthen that. Yeah, for sure. So we took a really um, interesting approach. I would I would definitely recommend it to anyone that is early stages in figuring this out. Um, so back, um, you know, a few months back, like I said, we we appointed uh, our, our general counsel as sort of our head of DNI. He launched a diversity council, um, and at that point, Better Cloud also um, started to fund ERGs. Um, and the first step with recruiting was we went and met with all of those ERGs. So our we sat down and we did what we called listening tours um, and we purely listened. We took notes and we, we let them speak um, and we got notes and notes and notes, pages worth of, of really meaty information. Um, and then we brought all of that back once we had went through um, the meetings with all of our ERGs. Um, we brought our findings back to uh, the diversity council as well as our executive team. And we came up with the roadmap of what was possible in the short term and then what was going to be sort of our midterm and long-term goals. Um, I think having the partnership between ERGs, the diversity council, as well as talent and making a plan together has made it feel like less of a people initiative and more of a, an overall company initiative. Um, and that's been really, really helpful. 
I think um, something that we're also doing is, you know, I, I find myself as we're talking to candidates, offering up more conversations, right? If they're, if they haven't gotten what they needed, or if they want to learn more, whether that's they want to learn more about an ERG that we have, or they haven't, you know, seen enough diversity throughout the process, just offering up conversations, you know, a candidate may or may not take you up on that. But if you say, hey, we have this ERG let me set you up with somebody who's part of that. It may not be part of the formal process, but it does go a long way. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I just think, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the biggest thing that we've also done is, is incorporate OKRs, which I sort of mentioned, and that really helps you drive the accountability um, and sort of take that, you know, from a, a nice to have to, to really, you know, a must have, if you will. I love that. I What I really love about something that you both kind of spoke to is, this important of integrity when it comes to DEI and an inclusive culture. It's not just about putting up pictures of people who look different. It's about one, as I mean, you were saying, really thinking about what diversity means to your company. Um, there are so many factors right now to consider that include things like socioeconomic status, education background, industry background, et cetera, that go beyond what people think of as just race and gender in the workplace that I think you know, it's really important to consider and how people come with multiple different identities. Um, and, and there's a lot there that, that they might need support or anything else during the process and when they're um, employees. Um, and then Jillian, I think to this point of integrity that you brought up that I love is um, what you said about OKRs. It's not just about to create the culture, but then making sure that, you know, there are we're tracking progress towards clear goals and that it's continually being embedded in everything that people are doing and that it's not just a people initiative, as you said, but distributed across the whole company. So I'm curious to dive a little bit more into this question. How are you driving accountability around DEI? Um, I don't know, Jillian, if there's anything else beyond uh, the OKRs that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think OKRs was was the, the first piece, you know, before we did anything, we launched a survey. Um, it was voluntary through ChartHop. Um, and we um, wanted to see how, how folks identified. And we can only know the progress that we're making when we know what the baseline of our employees looks like. Um, and that's, that's always going to be a work in progress, right? But it gives us a benchmark to sort of continually work against. Um, and, and we, you know, we are, are constantly hoping that more and more people fill that out. But we, it's, it's voluntary as of right now. Um, we're also looking to do more on school partnerships. And as we do internship programs or entry levels, making sure that we're partnering with the right schools. Um, you know, I think it's the work around DNI is it's, it's never ending. And, and I think just also being open to knowing that this is going to be an evolving roadmap and knowing that it may constantly change and grow. Um, if your company is okay with that, that's that's the best outlook to have around it because there's always going to be something new. You're going to you're going to be in conversations like this and you're going to steal something from what another company is doing or borrow this or borrow that. Um, and that's how we'll all get better. So I just think like more of these conversations leaning on other networks and leaning on each other so that we are all constantly evolving together is, is really important. Absolutely. The importance of community can never be understated uh, as everyone evolves and especially in this digital space now that there's so much so many more venues for open source knowledge and uh, that meaningful collaboration. Um, I'm curious, I may anything, uh, any thoughts you have about DI and accountability? Yeah, I think for us, you know, it is an evolving process. Our head of people meet with ERG members, discuss recommendations they have in place and culture, and we work collaboratively um, to determine solutions. So taking it one step at a time, but again, always all ears um, because our employees know best, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and also similar to, I think your experience, Jillian, is really thinking of the relationships between ERG members as, as a partnership and always having those flows of communication open. Um, and I think uh, in addition to DEI, another thing that's come up for candidates during interviews is thinking a lot about what compensation packages look like these days. I think with these emerging health crises and also uh, people moving out of offices and needing to redefine where kind of some of that money that would have gone to their lease or whatever would go now. Um, I'm curious how 
you've seen or you've implemented different changes in benefits packages uh, over the last year? Yeah, I think it's really ensuring that the employees have the best in class benefits, right? And you need to be realistic, right? If you're comparing a massive corporation that's been around for many years, it's not, you know, apples to apples with the startup. So I think, you know, as a team, you really need to educate folks on the bigger picture, right? If you're coming from a big company that has a matching 401k, there's a high chance you're not going to get that at a startup that's only been around for a year and a half. But I think as a people team and within the HR space, really take a look at everything that's happened this past year, right? Putting aside budget for our um, employees to have, you know, um, take mental health days or, you know, providing, you know, resources them for them around that aspect as well, but also creating as many competitive benefits as possible because I do speak with candidates from time to time that it's like, do you have XYZ? And it's like, no, but I have uh, ABC and that should work, right? And then giving them a bigger picture that on top of that, you know, you'll get equity and, and so on and so on. So that was a lot, but I just feel like when it comes down to it, it's making sure that, you know, as competitive as you can get with the budget that you're allocated. Absolutely. Uh, Jillian, do you have any thoughts there around benefits? Yeah, I mean, I just also think it's it's listening to your employees, right? And I think uh, the more you can survey and listen to your employees on what they're looking for and what they're needing and, you know, setting the expectations that, you know, you may ask for X, Y, Z and we can't deliver on everything, but hearing from your employee base is always the best way to go about that. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I'm very fortunate that Better Cloud does really well. Um, I, I think also with candidates, you're seeing a lot more in this marketplace where, I've noticed that candidates, while it is a, a really hot market, work-life balance is coming into play. And that is speaking volumes. If candidates are getting the sense that this is a, an environment that is not, doesn't offer balance or, you know, isn't uh, top of mind for when you think about mental well wellness, um, that may be steering them in another direction that maybe from a cash standpoint is a little bit less, but their well-being is going to be better. I think that that has been a really drastic turn that we've seen over the last few months. Absolutely. And I love um, kind of just like this thread that's evolved, I think, through throughout the whole presentation is just the absolute importance of meeting your people where they are, whether it's through surveys, focus group conversations, one-on-one -on -one talks. It's just so, so, so important to build these things from the ground up. Um, and so I, I love that that's been this resounding theme throughout because I think it's so important. Um, and then I'm curious, like, just with all of these shifts that have been happening, both in the need to change benefits, to invest in new technologies, to uh, rethink what people on your people or HR teams are doing on the day to day, how do you advocate for resources to your executive team to get those things done? Yeah, I can, I can jump in there first. Um, I, I mean, I think it's important to know your audience, right? So unfortunately it's, it's often that the, the people team is, is one of the last teams that is, is built up, you know, really fully at a company, especially, um, in smaller companies. Um, and so I think, you know, just coming to the executive team with really firm data, with really firm KPIs, speaking in terms or language that they understand and they operate in will help you uh, make the decisions. If you can compare, you know, how this is similar to another company or compare it to, you know, I, I often compare candidate experience to how we think about a customer journey. And that always resonates, right? They never... Out, out of the gate, you know, it's, it's hard for them to look at it the same way. Um, but really without, without the people or without the, you know, the employees, what is a company? We are, we're really the, the, the first piece. Um, and I will say that through and through, I feel really passionately about that. Um, but I think that is the, the best way to think about it. Um, but when you're, when you're presenting up to the ELT, I just always think being data driven and, and really sort of rooting your conversation in, in metrics and, and, uh, you know, KPIs that they can get behind. Absolutely. And, and I think I may have said earlier, you know, people are your most important assets and that's, that's a firm position at the end of the day. And so, you know, whatever way uh, you can back data examples to bring that to life, I think is always really powerful. Um, and what advice do you have for other recruiters, talent acquisition professionals, hiring managers, out there uh, trying to get a handle on all these major changes happening at once? I'll go first there. Um, so 
I think there's two parts to it. One is networking, right? And utilizing different resources. I've joined so many different Slack channels, whether it's for recruitment um, members or even other folks within the tech space to really brainstorm ideas and really make sure that, you know, you're learning as much as you can. But I think when it comes to, you know, recruiting, you need to be a strong partner to the hiring teams, right? Be that support system, you know, over deliver and, and under promise if that's the right term for it. But I think it's really important to make sure that no one feels, you know, uncomfortable when they're interviewing or anything like that and really set the right um, expectations up front. But also when it comes to, you know, dealing with candidates, be transparent, right? I, I hear horror stories where candidates will apply to jobs with no description of salary expectations. They jump on a call, they spend 30 minutes to realize that it's 50K less than what they're currently making. So I think like being transparent from the job description is so important. But then throughout the interview process, right, I think the people team slash recruiters should be straight um, up front with expectations of the position, who they're reporting into, and salary expectations so that we don't get to um, a time where you go through five steps in the interview process, uh, an offer is made, and no one's in line with anything. So I think, like, those are some key parts that I look into, um, you know, for other recruiters as well. And um, Jillian, curious, any any advice you have for our listeners and uh, talent acquisition professionals? Yeah, I, I think the soft close is, is the most important uh, piece to the puzzle right now. Because of how hot the market is, I think the, the constant communication with the candidate and not, not just communicating with them, but as you're wrapping these conversations saying, you know, if we were to make you an offer today, what does that look like? Would you accept? How do you stack rank us against other opportunities? So that when it comes down to it, you have a really clear understanding of where that candidate is um, so that you're not falling in love with the candidate that maybe is not falling in love with you as well. Um, it's your job as a recruiter or a talent professional to uh, really be the subject matter expert internally. Uh, I think we, you know, you often see there's there's two very different lanes that recruitment teams take. You know, there's the, the through the eye of like, it's looked at as a gatekeeper. It's a nice to have conversation. Or you have the really strong recruitment teams that hiring managers and ELT, they really look at as subject matter experts and they know that you're guiding them because you know the market in and out. Um, and that's the way that you want to be. And you get to be that way by, really absorbing everything that the market is telling you to do and giving, you know, all of those nitty gritty facts back from the candidate to your hiring manager. Absolutely. Um, and I'll ask just one more question here until we go into the Q&A and start uh, speaking to what the audience is wondering. Um, what is top of mind for you as, as you think about the months, the year ahead, you know, there's, even though things are rumbling open, there's still so much uncertainty. So, what what are you thinking about? We'll start. Let's hear from from you, Jillian, to to kick us off here. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious to see. You know, I think we're going to constantly have to evolve on what this digital um, interviewing world looks like. And I think companies are going to have to continue to like up level what that looks like. Um, I think even as uh, you know, there's rumblings of offices returning or people going back, you're never going to have an office that is fully staffed or, uh, you know, go back to that, that world of interviewing on site. And so I think, um, you know, I'm curious to see what sort of tools come out or, you know, how companies just continue to sort of up level uh, the, the candidate experience. Um, um, and I'm, I'm going to look to constantly, you know, steal or, or borrow ideas as other companies are doing it. But I do think that is something that's uh, underrated, right? I think as we are all figuring this out together, um, I, I look forward to more of these conversations and more networking groups and, and just more recruiters and, and people professionals getting together to share best practices. Um, we are really building what this looks like. And I think we'll all be stronger on the other side if we start to shift our mindset of it being, you know, uh, fighting for talent and really just sharing talent and figuring out like where the best home for somebody is. Absolutely. And I may any any last thoughts there for you? What are what are you thinking of with Chart Hoff's talent strategy coming up? 
Yeah, I think we're in a different phase um, being around for a year and a half, but everything Julian said is definitely top of mind for me as well. Being able to have strong processes in place, buy-in from leadership, right? And making sure that you're working cross-functionally with different departments, whether it's, you know, partnering with marketing to developing things like employee value, uh, value proposition and making sure that, you know, we're setting us up for success, but thinking ahead and thinking the bigger picture. We can't, you know, get to a situation where we need to, you know, have a panic attack and think fast we need to make sure that we're ahead of the game when it comes to that with certain, you know, company responses with different things going on with the market and different events happening. Um, so that's, you know, how we would evolve this year. But depending on how fast we grow, um, you might need to shift that strategy, right? Absolutely. It's, I think it's all about saying agile and nimble and responsive. Um, and I think something that you both spoke to is when you have these really strong data foundations, uh, you can you can make those decisions faster. Um, you're you're not as surprised if you are anticipating what's happening next. Um, obviously, we're we're not future future tellers here, but to the extent that we're able to anticipate and predict, um, uh, data is definitely a, a useful tool. Um, okay, so moving into some of these questions, um, some. Someone has asked, uh, one of our clients offers different teammate referral bonuses based on diversity categories when hired, more for some, less for others. What are your thoughts on that? Personally, I am not a fan of that. I think that's discrimination if, you, if it comes right. down to it. Right? I also think it could be a lawsuit if anything's written down um, that if we hire a Asian female, you'll get X amount versus hiring a Latina uh, female. I think that's just something everyone should avoid. Um, but if anyone has a strong argument to that, I am all ears and happy to listen. Yeah, I, I'd echo everything I may have said. I, I think it's I think you should just put together a really strong referral package or a referral bonus that is works across the board that incentivizes your employees to want to refer people that uh, you know fit the culture that match the values and that would be an excellent match to the role regardless of what their their background is. Also, I think when it comes to like categories, I think it should be by roles, right? Obviously, right now, everyone wants engineers. Why not make engineers the, the highest paying referral versus an entry level position, right? There are a lot of creative ways around that to incentivize, um, you know, our employees, but make it fun, right? Have a dashboard where it's like whoever um, each quarter refers the most people gets a fun swag, right? Or whoever um, converts into actual hires, not only will you get payout, but you'll also get another fun swag. So it's all about making it fun, inclusive, and definitely just as careful as possible. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the tactics Jillian was saying earlier is, you know, partner with schools, partner with programs, look up local nonprofits in your area uh, that, that might have talent pipelines um, as ways to, to source diverse candidates. Um, I'll also say, you know, this, this is a conversation that the chart hop ERG has been having. Uh, some members actually are quite in favor of doing a heightened referral bonus for diverse people. And the logic behind that is, um, you know, diverse people in the tech industry are out there, but they're not always being sourced. What are ways we can encourage sourcing? But then others are also of the mind, uh, similar to um, what something both of you expresses. Imagine if you're one of those candidates and you come in first day and hear that there was a, a bonus price put on your identity. How does that then make you feel? Um, and it, it can also result in some tokenization. So um, it's you know it's definitely an ongoing process. And I, I've also seen a few companies that have done this, and and I'm curious to see <laughs> uh, any case studies as as those evolve because it definitely is um, you know it, it's a tricky issue. Um, and then, so another question that came in is, what data is most important to look at in your recruiting pipeline um, as a way to help drive your strategy? 
Yeah, so I, I can take that off the bat. So we run a couple of reports at all times in the background um, that I think are just really good benchmarks. So some of them are things like time to hire, um, source reports. So knowing where your candidates are coming from, you know, referrals always is, is top of mind. If referrals drift, maybe we need to bump up that referral bonus. What agencies are working, what agencies aren't working. Um, we're always looking at company-wide pipeline uh, across the board. Um, and then we're running um, gender and race reports and we're bringing that down all the way to the hiring manager level so that we can really um, break down any biases that we may have. Awesome. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's all about the data and, and iterating and growing. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, data is also something useful in just even level setting expectations. Like if a hiring manager comes to you and they're like, you know, we need this new hire hired by X date you can at least give them some sense of what a realistic timeline based on how the process usually goes for time to hire for that specific role or industry. So I think it's just one of those things that gets helpful across the board. Um, also, sorry to cut you off. I think it's also important to be open-minded, right? As a recruiter, if this is something, this is a position you're, you know, the first time recruiting for, having that open dialogue, it's like, all right, let's meet every single week. Let's talk about pipeline, see where we stand. What are the challenges? Do we need to change the comp? Do we need to change, you know, something about the job description? And when it comes back to data, I think the recruiter needs to do a, um, their job in gathering market research, right? Something I definitely do is I would never come back to a hiring manager and say that you need to change the profile of what you're looking for without market research, right? So I think like that's the most important data piece when you're trying to hire and making, you know, the right decisions. Absolutely. Um, and another question I'm wondering is, so of course, the focus of this presentation has been on uh, considerations as people are starting to hire again. But not everyone is hiring right now. Uh, companies are still on hiring freezes. And I'm curious what advice that you have for um, those people that are still not ready to open their doors up just yet. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing is start to pipeline. Um, I think every company knows the, you know, the, the types of profiles that they like. Start to build out really great projects within LinkedIn so that when the time is right, you're you're set up for success. You have, uh, you know, a bulk of candidates that you love what they look like and you love their experience and you can start to send them a message right, you know, right off the bat so you're not building that when the lights come on. Um, I think that would be really helpful. And then again, I think just cleaning up systems. We talked about that a little bit in the beginning, but making sure that when the lights are on, you're not scrambling to, to be ready to go. I think that the day you're ready to hire, you should be you know ready to go. Absolutely. Um, and then one last question here before we close it out. Uh, someone is wondering, uh, so OSHA has been quite silent so far on returning back to work and whether the vaccine for COVID can or should be mandated. Um, and that's definitely opened up a can of worms for HR teams. I'm curious, any considerations that you'll have either uh, planning in-person retreats or any reopening plans on the horizon, uh, how you're treating that? I think at the end of the day is top of mind is are the employees, right? I actually know someone that is going to quit her job because her company is forcing everyone to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you need to leave it up to the, the employee. Are they comfortable? Are they not? Right. And if you're not comfortable, totally fine. We would never judge you. You know, your company should actually care about you, right? Whether it's making sure you're comfortable coming to an onsite um, or an offsite to meet with the rest of the team. And if you're not, then we can do something else. Right. So I think like it's really, really important to take everyone's feelings into consideration. It's still such a tricky time right now that the subject is very sensitive. And as you know, a people team you really need to reach out to individuals, um, uh, like confidentially and just seeing how everyone feels or just rolling out polls, right? Who's comfortable to meeting up for an event? Who's not? If not, what are some alternatives you'll be open to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's you know, that it's, it's listening to your people is the most important thing. If you, if you walk away with one thing, like listen to the people and let them guide the, the, the actions that you're making, uh, better cloud just sent out a survey and it was awesome. It went into as detailed as, you know, if you were to go back, what were the conditions? What do you need? Is it, is it vaccines? Is it masks? Is it gloves? Like went into full detail. There's no question that is too, has gone too far. Um, so I just think take, take the actions off of what your employees are saying. 
Absolutely. All, all goes back to building, building those plans from the ground up. Um, so that concludes our uh, presentation. I guess before we pass it back off to the HCI team, um, Jillian, I may would you like to share if anyone would like to continue the conversation with you after, where can they find you? Yep, um, you can definitely connect with us on LinkedIn. Always happen to brainstorm and chat through um, different ideas with everyone. So please don't be shy. Yep, connect with us on LinkedIn. Awesome. All right, uh, turning it back on to the ATI team. Well, thank you so much. That was truly an enlightening session. Um, here's just a few reminders. Today's webcast has been approved for HRCI and SHRM credit, as well as for HCI recertification. Your credits for attending this webcast will show up in your My HCI profile under the transcript tab. And while you're there, don't forget to check out hci.org for even more insights, as well as information on our courses and conferences. I'd also like to say one more thank you to our presenters today and to the good people at ChartHop. And I'd also like to thank you, our webcast viewer. Thanks for spending this hour with us and we'll see you next time.